I'm Bob Hauser, uh, Executive Officer of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge. Uh, and I get uh, to decide just now how to use my 15 minutes of fame here. Um, so let me start by asking a couple of questions. Uh, the first question, perhaps the most important, is would you raise your hand if you were here yesterday? Okay, so we'll forget about that slideshow. Uh, um, I will, however, say a f just a few words that are sort of um, uh, connected to the business of space and mapping and so forth. Um, and that is that the APS is one of three major learned academies in the United States. The other two are the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And both of those are spin-offs of the APS. The APS is the oldest and smallest of those, having been founded by our friend Ben Franklin in 1743. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences was founded by someone else you've heard of, John Adams. Uh, and why did he want to create another academy when he had just been elected to this one? And the short answer is that it was too far from, from Philadelphia to Boston. And then the other spinoff was the National Academy of Sciences in 1863. Uh, when a war was going on and there was some need for immediate scientific advice. And that was started by two members of the APS, among others, um, um, Alexander Dallas Bache, who was a great grandson of Ben Franklin, and um, Louis Agassiz. So why did they start the National Academy of Sciences? I was told that it's because it was too far between <laughs> Philadelphia and Washington. So there we have the story in brief. Second question, do you live within 50 miles of the place where you were born? Raise your hand if you were. Okay, now, accept people, not if you were, answer the same question again, but don't raise your hand if you were born in Philadelphia. So everybody, almost everybody here is a traveler, okay? And, and sort of what's interesting about that in the context of maps and mapping and so forth is that that actually isn't the case for most people now. Most people stay pretty close to where they were born and raised. Uh, but that was, and accepting the great immigrations to the United States, that was pretty much characteristic of populations uh, in the colonial and early American period. People tended to stay put. So we live in a very different era. Now, there is all this, these, uh, there are various stories to the effect that all history is present history. And so that colors what we do and what we say about the past. Uh, here's one quote, uh, quotation from a chap named Paul Cartledge. All history is present history in the sense that the concerns of the present are bound somehow to affect the way history is studied and written. All history is also personal, since it is impossible to avoid the influence of one's own opinions and prejudices on the selection and emphasis of one's historical material. And yesterday, there was a, uh, one of our discussions quoted R.G. Collingwood to the same effect. We risk misunderstanding the past when we bring our own perspectives to it. Now, I'm not planning to beat everybody up because of those uh, those thoughts. In fact, my reading as, as a non-historian, uh, I couldn't be too much further from history, um, is that that's really not been a problem in what I heard yesterday, not at all. Uh, my observation is that, and perhaps my argument, is that there's precious little of those flaws in the presentations that we heard yesterday, which is all to the good. I could give you a counterexample that doesn't depend on history. I recently was per surfing the web and I came across a description a, at length of a narcissistic personality. And it went on and on and on. 
And then I realized that it was written after the inauguration of our current president, and so I decided that it was perhaps colored too much by what had been observed lately. Anyway, so what did we hear yesterday? I'm gonna run this. This is gonna be kind of the uh, cliff notes for the coming exam. So Aaron Holmes' elegant account of mapping a nation focused on the materiality of maps. The exhibition across the way ranges from the technology of, serving, of surveying, drawing, and printing maps to numerous, numerous examples of politically influential maps, but in ways that leave much interpretation, thankfully, in the eyes and minds of the viewers. They're not being told a fixed story. We missed Katie McKinnery's account of the map of the Battle of Yorktown, and unfortunately, but it played a big role in creating a patriotic legacy for the nation. Derek O'Leary's account of conflicting visual accounts of the boundary between northern Maine and Acadia highlighted both a long-standing, a long-lasting political conflict and the way in which state and national archives helped to lead to a solution. Martin Bruckner's brilliant set of questions showed the limits of what we had learned from those papers. In the next panel, Christian Coote showed how a crude watercolor overlay of Morgan and Berry's 1676 map of New England in the Middle Atlantic encouraged border disputes among the colonies, a lesson in accuracy perhaps mimicked in political import by a recent overlay you may have observed of a weather map. George Galway's account of Albert Gallatin's role in setting America's boundaries drew heavily on Gallatin's social background and his long-standing Swiss heritage. Emily Conroy Kurtz ably showed how both global and local maps helped missionaries raise attendance, and presumably dollars, at their meetings by combining doses of knowledge and inspiration. And she showed how the scale and location by which I meant the display of such maps helped make the shows a success. The overall lesson of that session appeared as Nicholas Gleiserman said, that people give maps power. And he also emphasized the importance of interrogating what map makers intended by their practice. Tamara Thornton wonderfully told the story of dual globes terrestrial and celestial, the mathematical practices associated with the latter, their use by the would-be learned young men and women with intellectual pretensions, and also, perhaps more importantly, those with a practical interest in commerce and navigation. She also charted the decline of celestial globes as the skies became more crowded with identifiable objects and other means of mental navigation became available. David Spanigal's account of mapping the boundary between British Canada and the US showed the growing power of science when combined with diplomacy to mitigate boundary disputes. Penelope Hardy reviewed the somewhat later work in charting ocean bottoms contours, mysterious creatures, and most important, currents, which proved important as water transportation and communication, for example, underwater cabling advanced. Her talk highlighted the contributions of Matthew Morey while he was chief of the Naval Observatory and the later cir circumnavigation of the globe by Charles Wyville Thompson. I would note, by the way, that Maury's charts were controversial even at the time that they were created. I, I don't remember the exact storyline, but I don't think that he and Alexander Dallas Bache were exactly friends. Um, however, the interesting thing about Hardy's account is that it was unique among yesterday's presentations in emphasizing the use of maps in getting from here to there. And I'm going to return to that point. One of the interesting sidelights of that session was a discussion of the irony that our daily observations of the world about us are often Ptolemaic, whereas science, and we are on the side of science here, I think, is C Copernican. The presentations on indigenous geographies were perhaps the most surprising and thus enlightening to me. And I should say, by the way, uh, I should have said at the outset, 
that I am far from being a historian. I'm a sociologist and statistician. Um, and my experience with maps was limited to something that was perhaps along the line of, of what you heard from Billy Smith on Thursday night. Uh, working for a city planner in Chicago, I once used yellow pages year after year to chart the decline of the neighborhood movie theater so that the University of Chicago would justify paying bottom dollar for an old theater on 53rd Street. But anyway, um, both Washburn's and Stewart's presentations about the Chickasaws and Cherokee, respectively, showed that those nations adopted many of the same political tactics in their negotiations with U.S. authorities that the latter had used in their boundary disputes with the British. I thought that was remarkable. Julie Reed, on the other hand, gave us a view of maps, and especially those in caverns, as educational tools of the Cherokee that had helped to maintain their culture for thousands of years. So that's the story. We're ready for the exam. Uh, I hope that I have not blundered too much in this all too brief account. I'm sure that I've missed a great deal of importance, but then I only have 15 minutes anyway. But I'm gonna charge on to offer a few thoughts of my own about the proceedings, maybe just one or two. In retrospect, I remain persuaded that with perhaps a very few exceptions, presentism does not deeply tarnish the accounts that we heard yesterday. Rather, the papers largely attempt, successfully in my opinion, to account for the role of maps in creating boundaries and exercising state and community power from the perspective of participants. At the same time, and perhaps this is a deliberate consequence of the theme of the conference, almost all of the presentations offer a remarkably static view of the use of maps. Maybe comparative statics a little bit, but basically static. They're about what's out there, not how to get from here to there. I'm curious to learn whether this is characteristic of maps of the colonial and early national period, or whether it's an artifact of the conference theme. In my life, and I expect that in much of yours, maps are mostly an account conditional on the status quo that we use to go from one place to another, such as from our birthplaces to our, lo our present locations here. The ultimate effect of this difference is our, and a sad story perhaps, is our use of GIS on tiny screens that give us no inkling of the big picture. Thank you. And now I would like to turn to our first panel uh, of the day, Contested Boundaries. Uh, it will be introduced and we will have comments from S. Max Edelson, a professor of history at the University of Virginia where he teaches the history of colonial America and the history of cartography. He's the co-director of Map Scholar, a platform for geospatial visualization and the humanities. He directs the UVA Early American Seminar at Monticello, a research community for faculty and graduate students in Charlottesville. He's the author of Plantation Enterprise in, the Colon in Colonial South Carolina. It was published by Harvard in 2006. And The New Map of Empire, How Britain Imagined America Before Independence, published by Harvard in, in 2017. Currently, he's researching and writing a new spatial history of the southern colonial frontier. So I give the platform to Max, who will introduce our other presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just want to join other uh, commentators in thanking our hosts, thanking Patrick and Adriana for your remarkable work to put together such a stimulating uh, set of papers that have led to lots of conversations outside this hall. And I want to make a special point of just saying how much I enjoyed Aaron Holmes' amazing um, exhibition, Mapping the Nation. And uh, a lot of us went over and, and took a look at it briefly. If you haven't had a chance to do it, it is 
uh, a tremendous uh, complement to what we're doing here. So it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists for our Contested Boundaries um, session. Uh, Lucas Kelly is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He received his BA in History from Center College and his MA in History from Virginia Polytechnic. His research focuses on the interaction between native nations and US federal and state governments in the Tennessee and Cumberland River Valleys. He is especially interested, as you've seen, um, in how changing notions of nationhood both facilitated native dispossession and offered a mechanism for Chickasaws and Cherokees to resist forced relocation. From 2017 to 2018, Lucas held a shared graduate research assistantship in community history and archiving with UNC's Southern Historical Collection and the Community Histories Workshop. And in 2018, 2019, he was a Maynard Adams Fellow for Public Humanities. Agnes Truyer is Associate Professor at the Université of Paris. From 2015 to 19, she held a position at the University of Pennsylvania, where she worked as a research scholar in the history department um, on, uh, uh, at, at Penn on Penn and Slavery Project with Kathleen Brown. Sean Fraga is a lecturer at Princeton University. He received his PhD in history from Princeton in January of this year, congratulations, and spent spring 2019 as a postgraduate research associate with Princeton's Center for Digital Humanities. His digital history project, They Came on Waves of Ink, uses archival US customs records to create maps and data visualizations showing how, showing how Puget Sound's first American settlers commercially engaged the Pacific world. His book project, Ocean Fever, Steam, Trade, and the American Creation of Terraqueous Pacific Northwest, is under contract with Yale University Press. Great. Lucas, you ready? So over the course of the APS conference, we've talked about a number of boundary disputes, uh, such as those between British, uh, British the United States and Canada and in Maine. Uh, and I'm going to talk about another one, but this one is between two indigenous nations in the Tennessee Valley. Um, so in the three decades after American independence, Chickasaws and Cherokees challenged U.S. expansion, but their methods often generated conflict between the two native nations. In the 1790s, Cherokee and Chickasaw leaders began to support clear borders as a way to both identify when white Americans settled illegally in their territory and to guarantee that other indigenous nations could not cede their land to the federal government. Yet bounding their national territory forced Cherokees and Chickasaws to argue for their particular nation's exclusive right to the land, including much of the valuable Tennessee Valley that had previously been the middle hunting ground shared by Southern Indians. And as you can see on this map, the region I'm talking about is right around here. So here's the Tennessee River and flows up into the Ohio and this is the middle hunting ground. To, so to support their conflicting territorial claims, native leaders crafted intricate legal arguments based on indigenous notions of historical occupation and creation stories, conquest theory, and even US treaty law. Recovering these arguments made by Chickasaws and Cherokees adds necessary complexity to historians' understanding of native territorial claims and the narrative of US colonization more generally. As historian Celia Belmesis has recently argued, colonization was opposed not only by force, but also by ideas, often ideas that were easily translated into European discourse, ideas that drew from Euro European discourse, or ideas that were generally generated precisely from cr cross-cultural context. Cherokees and Chickasaws certainly articulated their claims to the Tennessee Valley as a way to resist American expansion, and indeed they succeeded in doing so for several decades. Both native nations, however, were also challenging each other's claims to the region, and their arguments provide a window into a complex conversation generated by American expansion, but occurring within Native America. The first major discussion of Cherokee and Chickasaw boundaries took place at the Hopewell Plantation in northwestern South Carolina in the winter of 1785 and 86. At this conference, Cherokees and Chickasaws demanded that the United States recognize their national boundaries and natural right to their territory. Cherokee, Cherokees believe that a formal border enforced by the United States was the only way to end Americans' continuing invasion of their boundaries. They explained how the white people have encroached on our lands on every side of us and hoped that the United States would adjust and settle our limits so that we may be secured in possession of our own lands. Cherokee delegates considered their national boundaries so important that Onatosita drew a map for the U.S. commissioners, a powerful strategy to assert territorial control. <clears throat> 
And here's a copy of that map. The Chickasaw delegation similarly articulated their na nation's boundaries in negotiations with U.S. officials at Hopewell. When the U.S. commissioners produced Onatosita's map, Piamingo, Chickasaw Nation's leading delegate, was unsatisfied that it did not demarcate Chickasaw's entire international, international border and wished Congress would point out his lands to him. He wanted to know his own. But instead of allowing the Chickasaws to articulate their national boundaries, the U.S. commissioners merely told the Chickasaw leaders that they must agree with the neighboring tribes respecting the boundary which would be determined, be determined at a later date. Before leaving the treaty ground, the Ch Cherokees did identify a Chickasaw claim on their map of the region, but Chickasaw officials never agreed to this arbitrary and ill-defined boundary. And you can see that is, oops, that's this line right there. Even as Chickasaw leaders negotiated with American treaty commissioners, Cherokees were working to support their own nation's exclusive claim to the Tennessee Valley, by combining European and indigenous notions of sovereignty and property. Cherokee negotiators, negotiators mentioned repeatedly that only their nation had native settlers living along the river, an important piece of evidence given white Americans' belief based on Lockean con conceptions that occupation and improvement of vacant land constituted legitimate property ownership. So this is happening in a subsequent treaty negotiation in the, seven, in the first decade of the 19th century over the Muscle Shoals. So this is the Muscle Shoals portion of the, Tennessee Valley, of the Tennessee River. That's north. And you can see on the map, as Cherokees are talking about the fact that it's their land, they point out that they have settlers living on it, an idea that many uh, white Americans would also be doing. And you can see on this map, which is here, held here at the APS, that there is an Indian village listed on this map. And this is a map from 1801. And it's the resident of Doublehead, who is an important Cherokee leader in the early 19th century. So uh, upon learning that uh, the Chickasaws had ceded territory in 1805, Cherokees also um, began advocating for a land session. In two separate treaties in 1805 and 1806, Cherokee leaders sold a massive amount of territory to the federal government, including their claim to the valuable land north of the Tennessee River, which Chickasaws still insisted was, was in their nation. So they're disagreeing on which nation could sell land to the federal government and how that process was going to work. U.S. victory over Great Britain and its indigenous allies in the mid-1810s renewed the conflict between the two native nations over their overlapping territorial claims. In 1814, Creek leaders ceded 23 million acres in what would become southwestern Alabama and southern Georgia in the Treaty of Fort Jackson. The session boundaries were left intentionally vague in this treaty, though, and white settlers and many federal officials choose to believe that it included territory south of the Tennessee River's Great Bend, land that Cherokees and Chickasaws claim to be within their nations. So again, there's still this idea that uh, this land in the Tennessee Valley is a, a cut, is a contested space. Over the next two years, Cherokee and Chickasaw leaders worked tirelessly to invalidate the Creek Session by combining their indigenous notions of territoriality with European concepts of international law. Their, argu their arguments often centered on land claims derived from antiquity, defined by a federal commissioner as evidence handed down by tradition and possession for a great number of years. Cherokee, Cherokees and Chickasaws hoped that an 1816 conference at the Chickasaw Council House would settle the boundary dispute over their conflicting claims, though they certainly could not have anticipated the outcome. Treaty negotiations took on the semblance of legal proceedings. Chickasaws called on witnesses to vouch for their interpretations of the boundaries, and Cherokees and American commissioners cross-examined them. Chickasaw opponents focused much of their testimony on past military campaigns and negotiations, their memories reaching as far back as the 1780s. Several Chickasaw leaders at this negotiation challenged Cherokee's land claims based on indigenous notions of ancient times. They explained how they had been taught that Cherokees had originally lived along the Atlantic coast before moving west. Chickasaws, by comparison, had occupied the present lands long before their, recollection, their recollections or of that of any of the nations living. So there's idea, this idea that the Cherokees are recent, recent immigrants to the region and so they don't, uh, their land claims are less valid. Andrew Jackson, uh, the leader of the U.S. Commissioner at the 1816 Treaty, countered Chickasaw's arguments based on testimony from federal soldiers and white settlers from Tennessee and the Mississippi Territory. Their goal was to prove that the region south of the Tennessee River had within, been within the territorial boundaries of the Creek Nation until 1814, making the, the session, um, making the session at Fort Jackson include much of this land. Thus, Andrew Jackson, the very embodiment of American expansion, set about making the case for Creek sovereignty based on oral histories, witness testimony, and reports from federal surveyors. The assembled Chickasaws and Cherokees must have been little surprised 
when, therefore, when the commissioners declared that they found the Creek claim the strongest, based almost exclusively, of course, on evidence provided by white Americans. American commissioners then pressured leaders of both the nations to cede land on the north and south sides of the Tennessee River. The Cherokees were first to relent, doing so in, sep in September, September 14, 1816, and Chickasaws followed up in a treaty uh, agreed upon on September 20, 1816. When both the nations ceded all of their remaining land north of the Tennessee River, and all the territory south of the river that had been within the boundaries of the Creek Session. You can see that on this map. So they're, they're, these, uh, their national territories are no longer contiguous. So there's white settlement that stretches from throughout the, the Great Bend of the Tennessee River and then south into what, is now, what became the Alabama Territory. The two treaties crafted the Chickasaw Council House ended the territorial dispute that had divided Chickasaws and Cherokees for at least the past four decades. It is tempting for historians to focus solely on Americans' deception in opening native land for white settlement. Yet such a narrow perspective overlooks the ways native peoples resisted U.S. expansion by adapting their indigenous notions of territoriality into complex and convincing legal arguments. These hidden transcripts, as one historian calls them, were powerful diplomatic tools in negotiations with both American officials and leaders of other Indian nations. Thank you. Good morning. First, uh, I would like to say how thankful I am for being here and being invited at the American Philosophical Society. Uh, it's a big deal for people who work on American history in France, so it's an honor. Um, I work on political history, mostly at the local level. I'm interested broadly in division as generative of power, and more than a periphery center of attention, I study how the delineation of geographic, administrative, land and political units uh, proves crucial in shaping local areas of power. I'm also interested in the combination of verticality along the several levels of hierarchy, but also how hierarchy keeps being diffracted along horizontal lines, particularly when you take into account what's happening at the local level. This paper is really the beginning of a project focused on these aspects. It is new to the point that I only just discovered Max Edelson's fantastic work, which explains why it is not cited in my paper, for which I apologize. And <laughs> I will be extremely grateful for your remarks as experts in uh, cartography and map making on the paper if you read it, or for comments that will help give direction to this work. Um, this uh, boundary dispute uh, between Pennsylvania and Maryland is emblematic of the chaos that reigned over territories literally in the process of being shaped. It allows to apprehend the components of a very diverse mosaic, how these people view their space and what they consider to be their territory. What did it mean as a settler for, uh, from Dutch or Swedish descent or as Catholic, Quaker, or Protestant? How did the Lenape delineate their territories and how can we reconcile the different concepts they brought? It's not, only, uh, it's not the only dispute uh, that ran over a long period of time, as we have seen, uh, nor the only conflict that was at the same time intrinsically micro-local and intercolonial, but also of a transatlantic nature, notably because of legal aspects that needed to be settled in a metropole, involving government institutions from the Board of Trade to the King. Thus, we see maps at, uh, as objects encapsulating different forms and levels of authority, and emphasize, emphasizing the tension de jure uh, de facto, whether it is Penn pushing his territory farther south or Baltimore keeping asserting his claim to the lower counties, although he's been rebutted twice by the highest authority in the country. Uh, it raises the question of legitimacy. In this case, is it Baltimore insisting on using his vision map uh, uh, because it's been provided to him by an agent from Maryland, uh, if fully trusted? Is it Penn's lawyer, John Paris, doing the work of a real historian, conducting archival research to find reliable sources, and manually endorsing each copy of the map to prove Baltimore's false pre pretense of deception? 
or is it uh, the composite map uh, produced by famous London engraver Senex, based on Champlain, Smith, and Blau, uh, to confirm the inaccuracy in this map and reveal the position of the false Cape and Lopen farther south and not at the mouth uh, of the Delaware Bay where it properly belongs, in place of Cape Cornelis. The, nomen the nomenclature here uh, was particularly significant. This is why I ended spending more, more time than planned on the origins of the name Henlopen, although I must confess it is still a bit obscure to me. Um, beyond maps used as, a weapons, uh, as weapons in a boundary dispute, uh, we see maps as the expression of imagination and desires, with the deceiving, disappearing uh, Cape and Lopen as embodiment of hopes and expectations for proprietors thinking in terms of land revenue, or rather lack of revenue. Obviously, the heart of the matter was property, uh, notwithstanding the cost of repeated legal battles. It would be interesting to have a, an estimation of the loss incurred from this approximately 25-mile stretch of land for which neither proprietor could collect revenue. Yet the dispute is also illuminating for what happened on the ground, the diverse actors involved in the process of running the lines, and the different degrees of expertise as vested in boundary commissioners, surveyors, and their deputies, and also measurers, carriers, axemen, roadmen, etc., less visible, just like the draftsmen uh, taking part in the process of map making, who would remain anonymous as only the names of the highest officials would appear on the final versions of the maps. Um, I could have elaborated on Mason and Dixon and how they used uh, the first uh, Zenith telescope in the colonies that Penn had, had imported from England for the occasion, or on Rittenhouse, who Erin was kind, to, uh, kind enough to reveal yesterday, is responsible for only five improvements to the compass, but not six. Uh, but rather than focusing on men of science and sophisticated tools uh, their crews had at their disposal for the survey, I want to shed light, uh, I would like to shed light on surveyors who worked before them. I'm partly, particularly interested in uh, Thomas Holm, first surveyor general of Pennsylvania, and I'm drifting slightly from Camp Penn Lopen here, although Holm attended one of the discussions between Penn and Baltimore. He was already 58 when he started working for the proprietor, though, so that was pretty much it. I found only one book on uh, Holm by Irma Coran from 1992, and I think Holm deserves attention. He had a very practical approach to science, gained notably uh, during the Down Survey in Ireland, when lands seized from the Irish needed to be allocated to the soldiers in the Cromwell army in year of cash. Holm benefited from the revolutionary uh, surveying methods introduced by Dr. Petty for the Irish survey, division of labor, with unskilled measurers and protectors and expert surveyors to inspect results, use of same size sheets for binding purposes, marked with the 10 acre division template or one single acre, portable instruments, although we saw uh, written house again, uh, is portable clock yesterday and uh, it does look like gigantic to me. Um, these men were already imagining the use of geography to apprehend the space. The down survey was definitely a good training for Holmes daunting task in Pennsylvania, even if the terrain was everything but open as back home and covered with thick forests uh, filled with wild animals, notwithstanding the potentially threatening encounters with natives. The physicality of surveying is a fascinating object of research and it would be interesting to uh, revisit these expeditions and notably examine the ratio along ethnic lines, like were any Saskatchewan present to help them, or how many slaves or maybe free persons of color would be involved. Holm was instrumental in implementing Penn's design for his province, and this brings me back to the delineation of space into units of power. Penn did not advertise Pennsylvania only as a refuge for religious dissenters, to promote investment, he also very pragmatically presented his province as a place of commercial and economic opportunity that would offer fields for agriculture, fisheries, mining operations, and man manufacturers. He had conceived the layout of the province with a multitude of tracts to be sold to investors along a design visible in a famous map drawn by a home. Beyond the land viewed as real estate, and thus as a commodity, 
These units mean, uh, meant privileged access to the province seat of government, to its main port, in other words, to the center of commercial, economic, and political activity. Home was part of the free society of traders, the group of Quaker merchants, Penn established as a joint stock company in England in 1681, with the obvious purpose of governing affairs in the province. The society was granted 20,000 acres of land and would uh, acquire much more, and its members were promised uh, three seats uh, on the provincial council in Philadelphia. As operating company, the society was short-lived, as conflicting interests arose not only with the Swedish, Dutch, and English settlers already residing in the region, but also with new investors who denounced uh, the society's privileges. Yet, thanks to the special concessions uh, Penn had granted them, its members retained positions of power in the colony. Walking along Chestnut and Fifth, as Billy Smith reminded us the day before yesterday, we are trading on Penn's very great design. His vision of settlements neatly close to one another is also intact in the upper counties of Chester, Philadelphia, and Bucks today. I need more knowledge on this, but the township grid system established from 1785 west of the Ohio River is very similar to this organization of space. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I want to thank everyone at the APS who worked to make the conference possible. My name is Sean Fraga. I'm a historian of the North American West. I study mobility, technology, the environment, and social change in the 19th and 20th centuries. In my book, I argue that American settlers interested in trade with Asia saw the Pacific Northwest and its deep harbors as valuable portals to the Pacific Ocean, then used steam-powered rail and maritime connections to build seaport towns around Puget Sound into global commercial hubs. Today, I'll be sharing a part of that research. I use a terraqueous reading to show how Americans used maps and geographic theories as tools for imagining future mobility. A terraqueous perspective emphasizes connections between land and water, both sites of physical connection, such as shorelines, wharves, and waterfronts, as well as larger narrative connections between continental and oceanic histories. Contemporary scholars often argue that Americans during the early national period used maps and geographic materials to think the nation. That is, to imagine the United States as a bounded physical space and to incubate a sense of nationalism. But a terraqueous approach reveals that Americans also saw the United States as a nation of shifting boundaries dependent in part on how and whether they could move within and across the continent, the question of how to get from here to there. Americans used maps and theories to both predict what the North American continent might hold and to imagine how they could leverage the continent's geography to engage in trade with the Pacific world. For centuries, Europeans had searched for the Northwest Passage, a mythic link between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans they believed would enable a faster, easier exchange of goods between Europe and Asia. The Reverend James Fontaine Murray, a colonist and teacher in 18th century Virginia, is a good example. He believed in a British theory known as symmetrical geography, which held that Europeans would eventually find that North America's western half mirrored its eastern half with major river systems stretching far inland. Now I hear some chuckles, but symmetrical geography was a valuable theory, both because it explained a territory that Europeans hadn't yet explored, and because it suggested that a short portage somewhere in North America offered a quick and easy route to Asia, to the Eastern Indies. That portage only awaited discovery. It happens that one of Mari's students was a young Virginian, named Thomas Jefferson. For the rest of his life, Jefferson read widely about North America's interior geography. French geographers predicted that North American rivers shared a common headwaters, a theory known as pyramidal height of land. Spanish geographers predicted a connection between the Northwest Passage and what they called the Great River of the West, 
all these books confirmed what Jefferson had first learned from Murray and pointed toward the same conclusion. A water route would carry Americans across North America to the Pacific Ocean. So when in 1803, Jefferson dispatched Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, and the Corps of Discoveries, their instructions were to find that route. The Corps of Discovery reached the Missouri River's headwaters in the Rocky Mountains a little more than a year after their departure from St. Louis. On the other side of the mountain, Lewis hoped to find the headwaters of the Columbia, as all the theories had predicted. But instead, he reached the summit, looked to the horizon, and in his words, discovered immense ranges of high mountains still to the west of us. It turned out that more than 300 miles of mountainous terrain separated the two rivers. The Northwest Passage did not exist. The expedition's reports and resulting maps effectively slammed the door on transcontinental mobility. And Lewis and Clark's reports and maps also changed how Americans envisioned their geographic future. In 1825, the expansionist politician Thomas Hart Benton warned on the Senate floor that the Rocky Mountains would limit continued American westward growth. He worried American settlers on the Pacific Coast, so far from the rest of the country, would eventually separate from the United States, just as American colonists had separated from Britain. The Rockies, he argued, should form the country's western border. The statue of the fabled god Terminus should be raised upon their highest peak, never to be thrown down. The nation ends here. 25 years later, Benton had an idea for a new statue. He wanted to build a colossal statue of the great Christopher Columbus gesturing toward the Pacific Ocean. There is the east, there is India. In a quarter of a century, the Rocky Mountains had changed, in Benton's mind, from western barrier to eastern arrow. What happened? Between 1838 and 1848, New technologies and renewed American interest in the Pacific world gave expansion to the Pacific coast fresh national urgency. Americans saw the steam engine as an instrument of manifest destiny, allowing them to connect new Western settlements to the existing United States. At the same time, with the end of the Opium Wars in China and the signing of the 1844 Treaty of Wangxia, which granted American merchants broader rights in China, Americans were eager to capitalize on new access to Chinese trade. Jefferson and his contemporaries had imagined that rivers would enable transcontinental mobility. But a new generation focused on Pacific Coast harbors as nodes for terraqueous mobility, points of exchange between the North American interior and the Pacific world. These ideas intertwined in Asa Whitney's plan for a railroad across North America, which he presented to Congress in January of 1845, before the United States was a transcontinental nation. At that point, the United States and Britain jointly administered Oregon country, roughly consisting of today's Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, while almost everything south of Oregon country belonged to Mexico. Even so, Whitney promised to improve American access to Asian trade and to keep new American settlements on the Pacific coast connected to the United States. His proposal gained widespread publicity, and a copy of his remarks reached President-elect James Polk. Whitney and other commercial expansionists found an ally in Polk who saw Oregon country, shown here, as, quote, the avenue through which the commerce of our western states can be profitably conducted with Asia and the western coasts of this continent, in the words of Polk's Secretary of State, James Buchanan. Interest in terraqueous mobility drove American expansion in the mid-19th century. In other words, Polk wanted harbors. Early in his term, Polk opened negotiations with Britain to divide Oregon country. During treaty negotiations, Polk huddled with Thomas Hart Benton, who brought copies of charts produced by Charles Wilkes and the US Exploring Expedition, including this one, annotated with the proposed border. I wanna take just a moment to talk about Wilkes and his role in shaping American ideas about geography and terraqueous mobility. Wilkes's expedition mapped the mouth of the Columbia River, showing the twisting, narrow, shifting, and shallow passages through which ships had to pass while sailing against the river's current in order to enter the river. You can see there's one here, 
and another one sort of here. Wilkes described, quote, mere description can give little idea of the terrors of the bar of the Columbia. But Wilkes offered an alternative. He reported that Puget Sound, just to the north, was far better adapted to shipping. He heaped praise on harbor after deep water harbor and believed that the Puget Sound combined depth, security, and easy navigation, especially in contrast to the turbulent and unpredictable Columbia River. Wilkes wrote, quote, there is no country in the world that possesses waters equal to these, end quote. But America did not, in fact, possess them, which brings us back to Polk and Benton, huddled over one of Wilkes's charts. As a candidate, Polk had called for all of Oregon, but as president, he agreed to extend the existing border between British North America and the United States along the 49th parallel. Buchanan justified the decision by explaining that the Straits of Fuca, Admiralty Inlet, and Puget Sound with their fine harbors are all south of this parallel. After months of negotiation, the United States and Britain agreed to divide Oregon country along the 49th parallel, and Polk got his harbors. The 1846 Oregon Treaty brought together several intellectual and political currents about the value of harbors, transcontinental reach, steam power, and Asian commerce to support a territorial acquisition strategy pointed at access to the Pacific Ocean. These ideas stretched back through American history in long-held hopes for a continental Northwest Passage. History looks different from the water's edge. During this period, Americans understood westward expansion as a terraqueous process involving both terrestrial and aqueous areas. Territorial acquisitions meant improved transcontinental exchange and access to global trade. A terraqueous perspective, emphasizing connections between land and water, shows that American expansion uh, emphasized international connections with the Pacific world and that these were foundational to the development of the US West. This view helps us see both how Americans used these maps and these theories to get from here to there, as Robert Hauser summarized Penn Hardy's work earlier, this morning, and how Americans imagined ways of getting from here to there. Thank you. Thanks all of you for those excellent uh, summaries and comments on your papers. Uh, my purpose here is to highlight what I thought were some of the interesting points of these papers and bring them together so we can have a productive conversation about them. Each of these papers explores the distance between conceptions of space and on-the-ground realities. They focus on the uncertainties of geographic knowledge encoded in maps and the ways in which maps can lend a false sense of authority to information that is biased or incomplete. Above all, they make a case for the kind of map history that is interested in map as sources, not just as illustrations. These maps can only be understood by moving beyond the frames of the maps and looking closely at the context in which they were created and consumed. Agnes Truyer reviews the cartographic record of a territorial dispute that simmered for the better part of a century. As the headstrong proprietors of Pennsylvania and Maryland wrangled over which province should claim the Delaware counties, and how the boundaries between these counties could be extended into the western interior, they used maps as evidence in a prolonged campaign to secure this territory. First broached in the 1680s, the conflict was only resolved at the close of the colonial period. Recounting this controversy is useful for us because it so clearly exposes how English colonization was conducted in a profound state of geographic ignorance. To call England's management of its largely autonomous Western settlements as an imperial state, as many do, gives it far too much credit, especially in the 17th century. The English crown granted colonial charters that carved up North America along geometrically precise lines of latitude, but it made no attempt to reconcile these charters where they were in conflict or conduct surveys to confirm the expectations of those who operated under them. The British Empire's modus operandi was instead to let the li lines of latitude fall where they may and work out the details later. In this especially contested part of the empire, Dutch Swedes, English Catholics, and Quakers, and others had created a patchwork of 17th century settlements in the Delaware River Valley. Lord Baltimore, William Penn, the Duke of York, all faced off against one another, 
competing to bring this heterogeneous space into some kind of civil order so that their ter ter territories would gain geographic advantage and set themselves up for future growth. It was akin to arranging adjoining territories as part of a geographic jigsaw puzzle in which the pieces could never fit. Over countless brokered compromises, each side put forward maps to advance its claims to territory and water access, exposing the limited empirical authority of all such maps, made at particular scales for particular purposes. All were bids for authority to determine where key places and sites were, but none were independently justified as the authoritative way of seeing this world. These settlements began as little more than outposts along the Atlantic coast, but as they advanced into native occupied interiors, colonial governments raced to trace boundaries into the West that had previously been geographic abstractions. Only when Mason and Dixon finally marked their famous line in the 1760s did this territorial dispute come to a close. But just look to the north and west of the Delaware River Valley at this very moment. The recent events of the Seven Years' War, negotiated treaties with Native Americans at Easton and Stanwix, the surge of post-war speculators, land companies, settlers from Virginia, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania created new scenes of profound geographic disorder. The best maps of colonial America put forward a picture of legal order from an absolute bird's eye perspective, but the competitive and violent business of colonization was fueled by these maps' irrelevance. My question for Agnes. Why should we compare colonial maps to modern geography in order to judge their accuracy? Isn't it fair to say that all maps were simply pictures of a deceptive order in a world that was really driven by disorder? Lucas Kelly takes us to the disputed edge of a negotiated boundary between the expanding United States and the Cherokee and Chickasaw nations. He forces us to look with spatial precision at the ways in which multilateral boundary setting forced two native groups to come to terms with differing conceptions of territory and national interest. His paper narrates the ways in which US officials played these native nations against one another in a successful bid to encourage them to cede territories that both nations claimed before their rivals did so. The outcome was a shameful story of dispossession by treaty, but with an important twist. Native negotiators appear as knowledgeable agents in this process. After reading Kelly's account, we can't simply say that Native Americans didn't understand the nature of bounded space or real property. They were pressured and exploited, not duped. At the Hopewell negotiations after the War of American Independence, Americans seemed willing to define a single boundary line between the US and the Cherokee Nation. When pressed by the Chickasaws to define a boundary between the Cherokees and Chickasaws, however, American officials demurred. Such a distinction was telling, I think. Although Indians believed that they were laying down a new map of a continent that was to be shared by American states and native nations, US officials saw a frontier line that merely separated two kinds of territory that fell within the sovereign boundaries of the United States, lands that fell within the jurisdiction of US states and territories, and lands that Indians occupied, at least for the moment. Instances in these negotiations, however, don't suggest irreconcilable spatial sensibilities. Instead, they point to a new native incorporation of Western cartographic idioms and property systems as a means of staking claims. Chickasaws contemplated selling disputed lands above the Tennessee River by hiring their own surveyors and setting a price per acre. Chickasaw and Cherokee negotiators cited well-worn principles of international law, documenting instances of development, occupation, and conquest that any Western lawyer would know as hallmarks of good sovereignty claims. My question for Lucas. What does native geogra geographic agency mean in this long-term process of dispossession by treaty? You argue that native peoples resisted US expansion by adapting their indigenous notions of territoriality into complex and convincing legal arguments. Convincing to us, certainly, but we're not the audience uh, that mattered to these performances. If such agency did not achieve its diplomatic ends, how should we understand it as a form of power? Sean Fraga suggests that the concept of terraqueous mobility can capture a new dimension of Americans' engagement with continental geography in the 19th century. I think it's an interesting and provocative appropriation. The idea of a terraqueous world first emerged in 16th century Europe as a way of reckoning with the news of long distance journeys of exploration and trade. Europe, Europeans had long been schooled in the idea that the inhabited world was an island composed of Asia, Europe, and Africa, separated from the rest of the globe by impassable seas and uninhabitable climates. 
After 1500, more and more thinkers imagined a globe on which land and water joined together in intermingling irregular forms. In this new model, there were no limits on how far the land might stretch into unknown spaces or where great seas and oceans began and ended, the terraqueous globe. And like 16th century cosmographers, 19th century American imperialists were forced to come with the almost unfathomable complexity of lands and waters in the North American West. As historian Paul Mapp's work has demonstrated, the American West was a blank and impenetrable space for European empires throughout the 18th century, made more so by native inhabitants who attacked surveyors and explorers because they knew that settlers would soon follow in their wake. Following the Louisiana Purchase, as Fraga shows, Jefferson and others reached for new models of geographic coherence that could promise commerce and communication along waterways across the full breadth of North America. When these visions collapsed, when this vision of symmetrical uh, continents uh, fell apart, uh, they reached for a new model, a new paradigm. My question for Sean, as important as Manifest Destiny is as a motivating ideology for promoting American geographic power, it seems all terra and no aqueous when viewed from your perspective. Its focus is on land, settlement, and integrating a vast domestic market for an emerging plantation industrial economy. In light of your focus on the geographic position of the United States in relation to this Pacific world, do we need to rethink manifest destiny as a key term in American history? Thank you. Panelists, I invite you to respond. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Oh, closer. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, I will try to answer as best as I can to this question. Um, first, um, I would say that there are two types of maps as we were, uh, saw again today, the map to go from one place to the other. And these maps today um, pretty accurate, <laughs> so, uh, as a difference uh, with what was uh, the case then, and so we can rely on them. Now, of course, I'm thinking of the maps around which uh, legal battles are conducted, and uh, those maps, of course, uh, are still the same um, idea behind them, um, and so uh, the difference also today is that these maps can be created using very sophisticated tools that allow, for example, to uh, determine boundaries and, and precincts using, for example, uh, specific voters' data. Um, so I'm thinking, of course, of the gerrymandering issues uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, specifically. Um, the interesting thing to know is that uh, as citizens, you can yourself use maps to, well, use these uh, devices to propose electoral maps for uh, the next uh, census. Um, and uh, the last survey apparently um, says that more than 70% of Pennsylvanians are in favor of uh, citizen commissions to draw these electoral maps. And um, you are invited as citizens to uh, participate in this process. And there are even sorts of competitions where you can uh, use those devices and send your own electoral maps uh, for uh, in provision of the next uh, census. Uh, that will be my answer for today. Thank you. Thanks for those comments, Max. Uh, yeah, I think that that question about native agency is really important. I mean, as as the last map I showed, um, all of Tennessee Valley does become the home of white settlers. Uh, and of course, we know the longer history of Indian removal that happens much, much after uh, my story ends in 1816. Um, I guess I would answer that the only way we can see native agency if we ch if we change our perspective and if we look at um, if we try to forget that we know the answer to what happens and then see these negotiations as they're going on and take Indians' arguments on their own terms and see um, the fact that they're that yes uh, in many cases they certainly are 
uh, agreeing or um, giving in to Americans' pressure for their land, but uh, I think if the, the way that they're doing so does, does reveal some sort of agency and the way that they're able to, um, in many cases, use uh, other na Native nations' claims as, sort of, as negotiating chips with the United States. Um, I think that would be my answer to, to that question, but I think it is important to to wrestle with how can we see native agency when it it doesn't it doesn't work in the long terms. But I think that maybe the way we can get around that is to change how we how we look at it, what what focus we use. Max, thanks for those comments and questions. Um, I think my project is an explicit call to rethink manifest destiny. Um, as a historian trained in uh, the American West, I think that the emphasis on the overland and agrarian aspects of the West has generally occluded the um, Pacific Coast and the importance of trade, particularly global trade in the history of the West across the 19th century. And I think an expanding manifest destiny, uh, it's a way of seeing American acquisitions of Western territory as pointed at access to the Pacific world. Um, and I, I think that thinking about manifest destiny in terraqueous terms helps us um, bound it a little bit geographically. If you think back to, to Benton in 1825 versus Benton in 1849, uh, manifest destiny shifts tremendously between the 1820s and the 1840s. Uh, and part of the reason is, as I said in the talk, changes in technology, especially the rise of steam technology, as well as renewed American interest in trade with Asia. And I think that it shifts also after this period, after the period uh, in which I closed the talk today. I was, I'm working on a, a talk for a conference next week, um, and one of my slides for that conference is the cover of Debau's Review, The Voice of the Slaveholding South, an issue from 1853 in which the headline is China and the Indies, Our Manifest Destiny in the East. So I think that after uh, manifest destiny is, is used in the 1840s to justify territorial expansion, that the meaning shifts and it becomes as much about trade uh, in the Pacific world as it is about, uh, it becomes in the 1850s as much about trade in the Pacific world as it was in the 1840s about the acquisition of territory in North America. And what I like about the term terraqueous is that it's, it's not maritime, it's not oceanic, it is, um, as you noted in your comments, a way of describing the unity between land and water spaces. So I think a, a terraqueous vision of manifest destiny is one that, that um, builds on all of the, the work that's been done about the relationship between American ideas of manifest destiny and territory and sovereignty, but combines those with um, a new perspective on, on how Americans engaged uh, with the Pacific world. Great. Question in the back. Uh, yes, I, this is uh, directed to Agnes. Um, I've been uh, studying uh, your area for a very long time. It's, uh, and as you pointed out though, uh, maps can be deceiving, manipulated, et cetera. But what I, and I, I loved your paper, it's probably the most comprehensive uh, report I've seen on this topic. Uh, but Charles Gehring, who's the uh, scholar up in New York, who's translated all the Dutch doc, well, not all, he's still working. Uh, 50 years he's been translating the Dutch documents. And unfortunately, a lot of these documents were not available because they were in Old Dutch. Uh, one of the papers uh, mentions that, and I think it was the thing that's, that, that, that uh, concluded this whole thing was there was a legal document. Your uh, old um, old world countries, when they are nation, I don't even want to call them nations, but in the old world when they came, when they had territorial disputes, uh, a lot of times they would rely on this law of who broke ground first. And in Lewis, Delaware, Svanendal, uh, the Dutch had broken ground there in 1638. So that was the thing that legally. Uh, put the nail in the, settled the whole dispute. So it wasn't just the, because then it fell under the, what you, you said, it fell under the Duke of York, New York claims, New Netherland claims. So that's how the uh, Maryland was uh, uh, taken out of the uh, picture. Yeah. Um. Uh, thank you very much. I, I have a, also a question for Agnes. Uh, you discussed uh, conflict 
uh, between Maryland and Pennsylvania about boundaries, but what about addressing the yankee Pennamite wars that were significant in northern Pennsylvania for some period of time related to uh, their claim on the Western Reserve? Um, I'm not uh, addressing those because I have not studied them, so I've decided to focus on, on this area. And uh, as I said, it's really the beginning of a project and there is so uh, there are so many uh, parcels and, and, and bits and, and, and sections to to, to study. Uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, to answer this. But thank you for for bringing up bringing it up. My name is Billy Smith, and uh, I want I guess I have short questions for each person. One is to just reendorse what Lucas was saying. It seems to me if we if we step back and say over 200, 250 years, almost all Native Americans get conquered, and therefore none of their resi resistance is futile, to use the old Star Trek term. Um, but that, you know, we can't, we can't see it that way. And sort of making certain, even if it only lasts for 17 years or 20 years, uh, it's still the equivalent of the Iroquois being able to protect their territory for 200 years after. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a successful resistance, I think, is about as, as most as we can say. Um, I, w I wanted from Agnes if any of your surveyors, to your knowledge, and you might not know, are they also asking for local knowledge from both Native Americans and other people who are living here, or are they really just uh, relying on their own technology to, to try and impose Western technology on that? Uh, and my comment for um, Sean, and I liked all the papers as well, especially Sean's, since I'm a Westerner, um, but the, for Sean is, of course, and he knows this, but just to remind that, you know, when Lewis and Clark get out there and they're with the Mandan over the winter, it's not just looking westward that allows them to see these mountains, it's the Mandan telling them what's over there. And so this is somebody really deeply steeped in indigenous knowledge, but again, that's something that you know, and uh, but I couldn't help but saying it. Um, thank you, Billy. Um, Penn was uh, very careful to um, arrange a contract with the with the natives, uh, so that his surveyor would be comfortable dealing with them. Um, they even signed a contract from the very beginning where he committed to be respectful and uh, notably that uh, his people wouldn't give them alcohol or make them drunk or try to subdue them in any way or, or deceive them. Uh, I think that Lassacock, I'm not sure about the pronunciation in English, was an interpreter that was very helpful uh, with the um, native people and uh, the dealings uh, that Penn started through uh, the intermediary of home. And um, I need to dig into, well, Dan Richter's uh, book about uh, all the, the well, pr the, the primeval role of those interpreters, uh, and uh, that might help uh, following networks of the people who were involved uh, precisely in all these expeditions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, you're absolutely right. Lewis and Clark depended on native informants and guides uh, across the the expedition, um, and there's a lot of excellent work, of course, on the links between. Uh, the Corps of Discovery and the indigenous societies that they encountered and relied on um, across the period. I'd say also that Wilkes depended, Wilkes and the US Exploring Expedition um, also relied on native informants and native knowledge. Wilkes brings a Hawaiian pilot from Hawaii to the Columbia River uh, because the man has experience. He's entered the Columbia before uh, and uh, Wilkes hopes that, that, that his knowledge will enable the ships to enter the Columbia in Puget Sound, wherever they go. Uh, Wilkes and his ships encounter native canoes, they encounter native societies, and there's an irony to Wilkes saying no country in the world possesses waters as fine as these because, uh, as I said in the talk, first, 
at the, at the time, America shared them with Britain, and second, um, Wilkes writes this down after he has met repeatedly the people who actually possess the waters, who are actually living there. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there, thanks. There's a question in the back. Uh, hi, uh, about this idea of the Terry Aquis globe in Manifest Destiny, um, how does the science of the XX expedition combine with the overt religious nature of the idea of Manifest Destiny and expanding it, in your view, to Asia and to the West? That's an interesting question. Um, American missionaries have been active in the Pacific world for much of the 19th century at this point. Um, But the question of connections between religious and spiritual motivations within Manifest Destiny and uh, the scientific goals of, of the XX, um, that's not something I've explored yet. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk more if you have ideas of, of where I might go in that direction. Hi, quick comment for Lucas and a question to follow up. Like, it occurred to me that this use of expert witnesses on the part of native people is also a strategy that's going to be used during the removal process um, that states don't allow native witnesses throughout their court systems, so that that actually is a strategy of removal. It just occurred to me that this is already underway earlier through these treaty negotiations, right? It becomes a larger legal precedent. But it also occurred to me, I'm thinking about Stephen Peach's work, that you know, is there is there potentially maybe something more explicit going on amongst these native nations where, you know, for instance, um, Cherokees are sending um, delegates to Creek councils throughout this period, right? So is there a learning process that you've possibly seen where they're using these bureaucratic negotiations and these legal negotiations as a slowdown process, right? Bureaucracies are slow. Um, treaty negotiations are slow. Is there any strategy at play amongst the five tribes, even if it's about we're going to argue with each other, <laughs> in order to kind of delay or think through, give time to another kind of process? So that, that, that was one of my questions. Um, a comment more generally on, on kind of native history broadly and why long chronologies matter is that the Eastern Band is the largest financial contributor to Western North Carolina today, a region that has been plagued <laughs> in poverty for generations. Um, Cherokee Nation's um, contribution to the Oklahoma economy is $2 billion, and that's one tribe. So I think if we say, oh, it's futile, um, we're not looking to really rural communities where native nations that have gaming and gaming compacts are contributing big money to states that might be failed in a whole variety of ways otherwise. And so is res resistance futile? These nations are still contributing big money to their local economies. And so <laughs> I'm not sure it's so futile. Um, you know, I, I think we've, these nations are not dead. We're still here. So thank you. Yeah, Julie, thank you for that comment. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I think that that it, the among the four, the five tribes, they definitely are um, using diplomacy amongst themselves as a way to resist uh, different negotiations and use um, in in talking discussing with American officials. They say, you know, we have to go consult with the Creeks or we have to talk to the Choctaws about this land. One of the things I didn't get to a chance to talk to talk about in my presentation is this uh, diplomacy amongst Native nations that we can we can pick up in the records. So. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar um, with how the United States, in the decades after the American Revolution, are is looking to European empires to justify their nationhood. So, one of the key strategies of American diplomats after the Revolution is um, making sure that that Europe sort of recognizes it as a nation. Indians are doing the same thing. Uh, one of the one of the uh, the key sources that I include in my paper deals with a conference um, between the Cherokees and the Creeks. And the Cherokees travel to um, the Creek Council House and want the Creeks to validate their own claims to the Tennessee Valley, sort of using this uh, these idea that they're, that the Creeks would support Cherokees' ideas about their um, about their possession in the Tennessee Valley and challenge Chickasaw's claims. So I think this inter Native Nation diplomacy is really important, and that's one of the reasons that I think we have to sort of decenter. We of course we need to recognize that the United States is important and essential for understanding uh, this period, 
But I think if we decenter our perspective a little bit from the United States and look at diplomacy between native nations, um, we see a little bit different story that isn't always mediated by the United States, that's also, that shows native agency amongst, amongst their own nations. We have time for one final question in the back there. Oh, geez. This is like, um, so I wanted to also pick up on the thread of uh, sort of the inevitability, the question of the inevitability of conquest and to the degree to which sort of maps reflect that. And um, I guess this really touches, I'm more familiar with uh, the 17th century, so this really touches on sort of Agnes's work. And uh, the sort of contradiction that I, this is actually somewhat in response to Max's comments too, in, in terms of maps sort of representing sort of European fantasies rooted in sort of ignorance in the landscape and they're just kind of throwing lines out uh, groping in the darkness blindly, and yet at the same time, sort of contradictorily, somehow, this is uh, the seeds of inexorable expansion. And I maybe I'm mischaracterizing your comments, but the two words that I heard that sort of was underscored for me was like violence and disorder. And in the early 17th century, you can find violence and disorder, but you could also find um, peacemaking. And it's interesting, you know, in terms of like the, the mapping, to, to what degree do these maps are reflective of reality, of course, the, there are indigenous peoples engaging both in calibrated uses of violence, but also strategic uses of peacemaking and their knowledge of, of terrain to engage with European powers, you know, strategically. And so that's how, you know, in the case of Swanendale, the, the Lenape, you know, killed the Dutch colonists in, you know, Swanendale and then turned around and made another treaty with them, right? To sort of reestablish, using this carefully calibrated use of violence to reestablish a relationship. This happens with the Swedish, this happens with the Dutch. By the time Penn gets around, he's relying on all these previous treaties. So, you know, I'm just sort of throwing out there the question of, the thinking about maps as both reflective of violence, but also about perhaps the role that peacemaking plays and seeing colonization in these more sort of complex ways is a power struggle. Can I respond, is that okay? Yeah, so um, I think I, you, you know, we talked about that's in the 17th century, that's also happening uh, later in the 18th and 19th centuries too. Um, a key distinction that I, I try to make in my work uh, is the diplomatic strategy between the Cherokees and Chickasaws. And the Chickasaws especially are using the fact that, for the most part, um, they maintain peaceful relationships with the United States as a way to sort of um, increase, to give themselves a favorable comparison between with the Cherokees. So they're saying, you know, to the U.S. officials, we've always been your allies, so therefore you need to recognize our lands and not not recognize the land of the you know, the violent Cherokees. And of course, Cherokees are doing the same thing using um, cycles of violence as well as peace too to maintain their boundaries, yeah. So I hope you'll uh, ask further questions over our break and at lunchtime, uh, please join me in thanking our, our panelists today.